<laughs> can't deal. They won't pay me my grovel check! There's like three or four people, like, mentally ill, losing their mind. She was like, I don't know if you know this, but did you know that what you're doing is highly illegal? I was gonna lose it. I was really gonna freaking lose it. He starts going, uh, in this direction, actually. I'm confusing my streets. I'm trying to get to... Wait, But I'm having, like, people yelling at me while I'm trying to video. I need to get out of Chinatown before I punch someone in the face. I just want to get out of Chinatown. Hey everyone, Stevie the Amateur Historian. Just about to walk my way into Chinatown. And uh, this one's this video's gonna be a little bit different than what I've done thus far. This video is going to actually uh, encompass two murders that happened in relatively close proximity to one another and only a few blocks apart. But the reason I'm putting them together is not just because they happen so close to each other, but what's even more interesting is that the two uh, main killers involved actually ended up in the same jail cell together after their crimes were done. So I figured, gotta do them together. And actually, one of these stories takes place in the vicinity of Second and Cooch Street, which is this intersection right here. But I'm not starting here. <laughs> to start, we have to go a little bit further west of here on this fresh episode of Historic Murders of Portland. Wish me luck. So, I'm trying to make my way over to 5th and Flanders, where this bloodshed, all from 1902, where this bloodshed first started. And it starts with this guy named Lester Belding. So Lester Belding and his wife, Sylvia, had been married for several years, come July 11th, 1902. They'd been married for roughly seven years. It was pretty rough. Belding, like a lot of men, was into drinking. And it just, it was never a great marriage. They had produced a child, a son named Eddie, who in 1902 was only like five years old. Uh, but pretty much since the day that these two married, Sylvia's family, they'd always been against it. They always thought Lester was no good. They thought he was a threat to her. They, pretty much her whole entire family, they'd all been just trying to, pretty much from the beginning, to get Sylvia to just dump Lester and find someone better. Or find just anything better to pursue in her life. And finally, uh, late June, or no, oh, start of July. It's only about a week or so earlier, so around, Independence Day 1902. She, Sylvia, finally took the leap. She sued for divorce. She was leaving Lester Belding forever. This is a problem for Lester Belding, who like most men of that time, and like a lot of men now, had the attitude of, well, if I can't have her, nobody will. And there was a slight problem with that because there was a guy by the name of Frank Woodward, who, at least rumor had it, Sylvia had started seeing. And that brings us here to Fifth and Flanders, and the site where Sylvia's uh, parents lived. A Mrs. L. McCroskey and her husband, Lem it's spelled L-E-M-U-E-L, -E I think it's Lamel. McCroskey. Their house, little tiny house, was located at this intersection of Fifth and Flanders. And when Sylvia left her husband, you know, she's in a transitional period, she started staying 
uh, at this house that was at this intersection. And on July 11th, 1902, Lester Belding decided to pay the house a visit. So in, in this general area, right here towards the corner, things begin to unfold at 9 p.m. July 11th. Lester Belding shows up at the McCroskey home here. He knows this is where his wife has gone to live for a while, so he knows he can find her there. He's angry at her for leaving her. He's angry at her parents and his, her whole family as a whole for pushing them to be separated. And she's mad at this Woodward guy because he's now seeing his wife. So he's got an ax to grind with just about everybody. And when he shows up here, not only is Sylvia's parents home, she is there and Woodward is there visiting her. So Belding shows up, sees his son Eddie sitting on the front steps, walks up to Eddie, uh, leans over and kisses him on the head. Woodward, the, the new lover, hears what's happening, sees what's happening, whatever, comes and steps up to the door without a second thought. Lester Belding pulls out a gun and shoots Woodward. Woodward dies. Sylvia is approaching the door too. She sees what happens. Lester turns the gun on her without a moment's notice, fires into her. She tries to run and flee, but she shoots her. He shoots her and reportedly she made it to the kitchen where she died. At this moment, Sylvia's mother stands up in response to what's happening. Belding turns the gun on her, shoots her right in the heart and kills her. Lamel McCroskey, the father, Sylvia's father, uh, starts hearing the shooting, immediately runs to grab a gun to defend the family. Of course, by the time he gets there, he's too late. The other three in the house have already died. He comes around the corner and starts opening fire on Belding, but none of his shots hit Belding, and Belding returns fire and actually hit Lamel three times. Lamel fell to the ground. Belding thought he had murdered him, that Lamel McCroskey was also dead, so his work was essentially done. He then reportedly turns to leave and open fire in the direction of his five-year-old son who was on the porch. Apparently, he only had three shots left. He fired three at his son. It seems like none of them made contact, but it was really sad to see later on, you know, authorities talk to his five-year-old son, Eddie, whose parents had, whose mom had just been shot to death. And for him to have to passively say, and then, you know, after he shot everybody, my dad tried to shoot me but it didn't work and Lester Belding then just walked away from the house. They said he walked across Fifth Avenue, which this is Fifth Avenue, to a saloon across the way. So I'm guessing there was a saloon where this big, actually I think vacated building is located. There was a saloon there. He walked in, got a drink, called the police and told them, hey, I just murdered all these people across the street. And, you know, maybe the saddest, most tragic aspect of the whole thing, though, was the fact that Lester Belding just, all out of his own selfishness, the fact that he couldn't handle the idea that his wife would move on and want to be with another man when he already had been a pretty miserable, sad sack of a husband in the first place. And the fact that he just went in there, opened fire, presumably killed everybody. Lamel McCroskey actually survived his wounds and later on, Belding would say that was his biggest regret was that he didn't kill the old man too. But the fact that after he had murdered presumably everybody in the house, including his little son Eddie's grandmother and mother, he just left the house and went across the street and got a drink and he left Eddie on the porch there to presumably be the, to have to walk into the house and to discover his family in there all murdered and shot to death. Obviously, it was an easy capture for authorities. Lester Belding wasn't trying to hide anything. He openly admitted to what he had done here. Didn't help when his son stated that, you know, he tried to shoot at him as well. Unfortunately, he got away. So yeah, he made, he made no effort to cover up what he had done. He even, he, he was proud of it at the end of the day. He thought he had, I guess, avenged a grave injustice made against him. Everybody was out to get him. His wife deserved it for leaving him. Woodward deserved it for luring his wife away, even though it was obviously probably inevitable that she was going to leave. And 
her Sophia's parents deserved it too for trying to break them up for so long. Another regret that, whoo, I just got very, very white. Another regret that Lester Belding had about his actions here is that more of Sylvia's family wasn't here for him to shoot because they were all, they all thought he was a deadbeat, and, you know, instead of fixing himself, because what man in 1902 actually fixes himself, he just decided to blame the rest of the world for his failures as a husband, probably a father. And he went on trial and it, it was it was a cinch because even when he was on trial, he made no effort to deny what he had done and he had no remorse for it. And obviously what happened here was pre-planned. It wasn't even pre-planned to the point that this guy just snapped and got a gun and as he was like walking here knew what he was gonna do. I'm pretty sure Lesser Belding was planning on doing this from the moment his wife said, I'm divorcing you. Um, he managed to borrow the gun that he had from his workplace, which was on 14th and Flanders. So literally, we're at 5th and Flanders. You go nine blocks directly that way down the road. That's where he worked. He borrowed the weapon he used there. He left a note in the till where he worked, admitting before the act had even happened, like as he was leaving to come down here to do it, he left a note in the register at the place where he worked saying, here's what I'm about to do. And then he went and did it. So I don't, I don't think there was any doubt that this was inevitably going to happen. It was just a matter of when it was going to happen. And I love, I love how <laughs> someone who had worked with Lester Belding described him as a shiftless, worthless fellow. Which I feel like "fellow" was just such a such a passive it's such a passive term today. But back then, it would have been the same as calling him like a douchebag today. So yeah, a lot of people didn't like him. Bounced around from job to job, heavy drinker. Um, someone who knew him even said he would have these like flights of fancy. He would get delirious. He'd lose his mind. And apparently, he would peer. This, I read this, this is printed in a newspaper. He would claim that there were like these demon, demon. I was mixing devil and demon. These like demon monkeys that would try to chase him and attack him. And he would just run. He would just run frantically because he thought these monkeys were trying to kill him. Um, so in addition to this guy being a heavy drinker and being a real jerk off, this guy was obviously a little crazy at the same time. So yeah, Belding took the jury less than an hour to find Belding guilty of his crime. It didn't help that it was reported that he frequented opium dens, which actually wasn't, according to the newspapers, wasn't illegal at the time, but it was frowned upon. This was probably like people doing, people smoking marijuana. It's astonishing, but that's still very frowned upon in this day and age. Everybody who does weed is a stoner. Everyone who does opium is just a lunatic. I think that was kind of the, the sentiment. And they wanted, they, this guy was so weird and so messed up and his act was so callous. I mean, he shot at his own, his own son for God's sakes, that they literally, he'd murdered three people in cold blood. They only charged him for one of the murders. And the re they didn't do that like, oh, there was a bunch of bureaucratic red tape and we can't really prove he did these other ones. They literally, the reason they only charged him with one of the murders was if somehow he was found innocent, they'd have two more murders to charge him with. Like they were invested in this guy going to prison. Now this was, again, this was July 11th, 1902. I'm now walking back towards the intersection of Second and Cooch where I started for another crime that took place specifically August 3rd, 1902. August 23rd, 1902. What the hell is wrong with me? So, less than six weeks later, there was another murder that happened just a few blocks, you know, a couple blocks back there is where Lester Belding went off. And I'm just a couple blocks now from 2nd and Cooch Street, where we transition from the name Lester Belding to a man named George Smith. Now, George Smith is an interesting story. George Smith in 1902 Portland, 1902 America, he was an African-American gentleman who actually had a white wife. Um, I know lots of places they didn't even legalize um, uh, interracial marriages till 
decades later, and I don't even know if it was legal at this time. You could get, I mean, you go far enough back in history, you could get away with anything. It was real easy to jerk the system. So I don't even know if it was a, if it was legal way back in 1902 for for this marriage to exist, but it did. And um, so here's George Smith, who, by all accounts, I've never seen any pictures, but by all accounts, he had a very beautiful, attractive, appealing wife. And all the white guys he worked with would give him would give him shit for it. People hassled him all the time. Um, and it was total racism. It was like, how does a black guy like you deserve such a hot white woman? When I'm a white guy, she should want someone like me instead. So, who knows how tumultuous their marriage actually was, if at all. But it seems like George Smith was kind of coming unhinged the more and more people hassled him about his marriage and I, th I think it made him genuinely paranoid he's constantly being reminded by the society around him that he's a lesser a lesser human um, and what if inevitably at some point his wife decides that that's also factual and that she deserves someone better and I think he started genuinely believing that his wife was having an affair with someone else who was that who knows but there was probably at least some white guy in town that she was having an affair with and that is I pro I tend to believe some of that but that's also kind of the official story about what happened August 23rd 1902 right here at the intersection of Cooch and 2nd Street now as far as I know like a obviously it's Chinatown a lot of these buildings are this building is here I think this was built in 1900, so this building was definitely here when George Smith was living here. He was living on this block. I'm not exactly sure. Rich Block, it says, was built in 1905, so three years later. Maybe there was a rooming house or something they lived at there. This building, I think, was built in 1912. Maybe there was something that they lived in there. This building, I think, is considerably newer than the other ones on this block, so maybe they lived there. But whatever the case, they lived in a building at this intersection. So how things start, I'm standing right across the way from the old Erickson Saloon, pretty well known place in Chinatown, been here for a while, and what happened is first, before anything big happens, George Smith is seen at a, a saloon at First and Burnside, which is a block this way, so only like one block down, one block over from where he lived. And I'm doing a lot of moving around because there's a lot of, there's like three or four people like mentally ill, losing their mind and I'm trying to evade them while I bring you a nice story of murder. Um, George Smith is seen, night of the 23rd, and he's at the saloon and he's being really loud and he's being really boisterous. He's probably been drinking and doesn't, his inhibitions are just gone and He's seen with a revolver in his possession, and he's ultimately heard to say something to the effect of like, I'm gonna kill a white person tonight, is essentially what he said. So he's seen doing this, and there's this witness, a guy named Carl Duval, not Duval, but Duval, who is apparently, I think he's at an employment office, kind of close to the vicinity of Second and Cooch right over here. And he hears what he thinks is a gunshot and a woman's scream. So of course he comes outside to see what all the hubbub is. And as he does this, he sees George Smith leaving the building that he lived in, uh, whichever side of the intersection it was on. He sees him kind of sneaking down a side entrance and trying to get away. And he, you know, fortunately, you know, you couldn't, just call police on your cell phone back then so there was a lot more beat cops walking the street so Duval was able to track down officers pretty quick and point out this suspicious thing you just heard gunfire a woman screaming and this guy fleeing the vicinity of the building near this intersection after earlier saying like you know at a bar he's gonna go kill someone that night like it's a little suspicious and from this vicinity this is again this is second in Cooch this is approximately where he lived at Smith apparently ran 
east towards First and Cooch Street. That was the direction he was seen running off in. And here we are. This is First and Cooch Street. Uh, in some ways, different, but not too much. You got Blog and Block, which I think was built in the 1880s. Um, so a lot of this stuff was here. This was pretty much like this, even way back in 1902. And this is the air, air direction, you know, from back this way, going this way, that way, who knows. Woo! That Max is looking very bright. But whatever the direction he ran, he was just last seen running from this direction, this way, and then kept going towards the river, who knows. But ultimately the police did track him down and apprehend him. And he was brought in for this crime. I, I gotta tell you, reading the newspaper. This this was rough. This was rough reading. Um, and I specifically wrote this down even though it really doesn't have much to do with the crime. It doesn't provide guilt or innocence in the case of George Smith. But it does kind of tell you how society functioned at the time and in certain ways things haven't changed. But of course again this is an African American gentleman in 1902 married to a white woman and catching a lot of flack on it. A lot of flack to the point where presumably he snapped, he either he became determined that his wife was cheating on him, something happened. Something made him snap and he killed his wife out of jealousy, out of anger because she was being unfaithful to him. That was kind of the general story that was followed. However, uh, an article from August 23rd, right after the crime happened, um, it was so racist against George Smith uh, but it was even more racist towards his wife who is now dead this is a woman who's just been shot to death you think there'd be a little bit of sympathy you think you'd give it 24 hours before you start being disrespectful but here's a white woman who married a black one a black man and the article in the newspaper I read referred to her as a woman who was a sent the murdered white woman was leading a pathetic existence not because of anything she was doing, not because she committed a crime, but just because she was a white woman who chose to marry a black man. Um, it said she was once pure and beautiful. I kid you not, it said she was once pure and beautiful. But of course, marrying a black man makes you ugly in the eyes of 1902 print media. They even call her pure, like she was defiled. Um, and then it essentially, essentially what the article argues is she was doing okay and then she descended to the depths of deepest depravity by marrying a black man of course they didn't use the term black man in the article they called the mar the marriage was referred to in the article i quoted it as an unnatural affiliation that was how they described the marriage it also said that smith george smith uh, lived off of the wages of sin as gathered by the white slave. They referred to his wife as a white slave to him. This is, of course, an article written the day the murder happened. So even if George Smith was murderous and abuse or was abusive and treated her like a slave, they wouldn't even know that information yet. In the filthy cesspools of North End morality, North End being kind of the Chinatown area, this place has always been kind of deemed an unsavory part of town, but essentially what they're, I think what they're saying there, by saying he lived off of wages of sin, gathered by the white slave, his wife, in the filthy cesspools of North End immorality. I think essentially what they're saying was he was living off the money his wife made as a prostitute. North End immorality, the, the you know, gathered by the white slave, wages of sin, wages more meaning money, so I think what they're saying is that he was living off of his wife who had become a prostitute and she'd probably become a prostitute in close relation to when she married him. Now, I don't know if any of that's true. None of the articles I read said anything about his wife. Uh, so uh, October 1902, George Smith goes on trial. Um, we have the witness seeing him running from the vicinity of the place he lived. You have the witnesses that saw him in the saloon making uh, suggestive comments, if you can put it that way. Um, and then the fact that he was an African-American man being held for murdering his white wife. But I mean, beyond that, just a, he was a black man who murdered a white woman. Like, if he was completely innocent, he probably still would have been found guilty at that time. I mean, you've seen how racist the newspaper was. It's not like the city was going to do this guy any favors. 
And Smith, the story that Smith gave that nobody really believed um, because of the society at the time, and I don't really know if I believe it, for why, what happened, what happened in his little home that would have been just around the corner of this Oregon leather building, he, again, felt convinced that his wife was being unfaithful to him. And when he arrived at home, he opened the door and he said he thought he caught the vision of another man in there with his wife and that he shot that man. He thought he was shooting at that man out of rage, you know, for catching him in the act with his wife. And what he thought was a man was actually his wife, so he accidentally shot his wife. Now, I don't really buy that because one, how would you shoot at somebody that quick? Like you open the door and it's like, oh my gosh, you shoot. And second of all, to shoot that quickly, you'd already have to have the gun out. Um, and it was obvious there was no man there with his wife. Um, so he can't even logistically say like he came up to the door and heard other voices and then got his gun out and peered in. And how do you confuse a random guy with his wife? Um, it just seemed like a, a nonsensical story that he just came up with because he just he wanted to come up with something to defend himself with. He obviously felt, you know, disrespected and blighted by society. He probably felt like society had driven him to do this with all the racism he and his wife had to face. Um, but of course, how do you, how, how do you make that right? The injustice that you and your wife are having by shooting her. Um, so he really never had a chance. So he was, like Lester Belding, he was convicted of the crime that he most likely committed out of a moment of rage, misunderstanding, jealousy, or all of those put together when you really get down to it. So in relatively close proximity, these two people, Lester Belding and George Smith, were convicted, sent to prison to be put to death, to be hung, relatively close to each other, and they committed the crimes that they'd committed within like, you know, six blocks of each other, six square blocks of each other, both in the confines of Chinatown. And wouldn't you know it, when they went up to prison, to you know, await their execution. They ended up cellmates. They ended up sharing a cell together, um, you know, at the state pen or whatever it was at the time. So they committed their crimes only like six blocks apart. They ended up getting convicted for similar murders. Obviously, Lester Belding killed more people, and um, but they were they were kind of both inspired by the feelings of infidelity, feelings of being pulled apart from their wives, taking the law into their own hands. How dare, you know, blaming society and whoever else you can for the inadequacies of your marriage and kind of, I guess in George Smith's case, the inadequacies of society. And so it's just bizarre that somehow when all is said and done, they already have these close, these close correlations with one another. And then they both end up not just in the same prison, but sharing a cell together. And actually, final point to this story. Lester Belding, who of course was only all too happy to admit his guilt and his pr proudness of killing all these people that had wronged him and disrespected him and undermined him, and however you want to put it. Well, of course, once he was sent off to prison and awaiting death, all of a sudden he realized, holy shit, what have I done? And he started trying to um, formulate an escape plan. And here's something interesting. He had been cheating on his wife for years. Forgot to mention that part. Lester Belding had been cheating on his wife for years. Um, and then lost it the way he did because his wife finally decided to move on. I don't know why he wouldn't just let her go and then hook up, <laughs> shack up with the woman he was already with. But, and I have to read this because it's such a ridiculous effort at escaping that I don't want to leave any details out. So here's the outline of the break. Um, so, January 1903 is kind of where this starts. Cora Dillon, that's the woman that Lester Belding has been fooling around with, and yet his wife is the one who's engaged in improprieties against him. So, she comes and visits him, and she, she's already able to slip him stuff in jail. The, the security there is not great. And he gives a note to a fellow prisoner who's about to get out, that he says, take this note to this friend. 
and essentially this friend was supposed to go buy some guns and ammo with I think money that Lester Belding was actually going to supply somehow buy some cayenne pepper and two blackjacks give these things to Cora and she'll bring them with her the next time she comes and visits Cora would then come back with the stuff she would show up she would blow cayenne pepper into the eyes of whoever the main guard was there temporarily blinding them disorienting them at which time she would get at his key ring get the keys away go and unlock Lester Belding's cell who where he had a couple cellmates she would give the blackjacks to the other cellmates and I guess give Lester Belding the gun because he's the leader and they would beat and potentially shoot their way out of the prison I kid you not this was the plan and what's so interesting is the reason it fell apart was George Smith, his cellmate, got in touch. Maybe he thought he'd, he'd get some leniency on his sentence. He went to, or he got in touch with the guards and told them like, hey, um, Lester Belding is planning this elaborate escape. Of course, the whole time denying he had any involvement in it whatsoever, even though the plan called for the use of Lester Belding's cellmates to help him escape so it wouldn't surprise me if maybe he'd been let in on it and he thought like maybe I'll do it but then it seemed like it was just too crazy so he decided to kind of backstab them and see if he could benefit from doing that by saying hey this is this is happening and you don't know about it didn't didn't benefit anybody it sure as heck didn't get him any leniency and it blew the whole thing out of the water Lester Belding tried to dismiss it as a as a joke going around it wasn't a real thing I was it was a joke I was never serious about that I was never I would never have Cora do that and the funny thing is George Smith because again I think he was just out to save his own hide went to the authorities told him about this elaborate plan but then he also said that even like Cora Dawson Cora Dawson that's her name right his infidel lover yeah Cora Dawson he even said that she wasn't involved but like the whole plan revolves around her getting things done outside and then coming in she's the one that has to incapacitate the guard she's the one that has to bring the weaponry so it's just a bunch of a chaotic mess didn't help George Smith didn't help Lester Belding they were still in prison awaiting the hangman's noose which they both they both experienced they both ultimately were put to death by hanging for the crimes that well we know Lester Belding committed and probably George Smith committed so I, I felt like I had to do those two stories together because the correlate kind of correlation together they're similar inspirations they happen only a couple blocks from each other and then when all is said and done they ended up cellmates together like what is what a crazy mixture of things all to happen all at once and that's the story of I guess you could call it the Chinatown wife killers <laughs> I can't really think of a better name for them <laughs> And uh, thank you guys so much for watching uh, this intriguing story. Very troubling, but intriguing story. Uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as you can enjoy a story like this. And uh, as always, remember to like, share, subscribe, comment, keep it clean. Hit up my Patreon if you want to help me out that way. Thank you in advance. And that's it. Till next time, guys. This has been Steve the Amateur Astorian having his ending ruined by some loud-ass bus. Give me a second. All right, I'm probably, no, there's another one. Anyway, this has been Steve the Amateur Historian with another episode of Historic Murders of Portland. Catch you later.